Good morning. Creation of um, COVID-19 vaccination passport, if to paraphrase the first astronaut who landed on the moon, is a small step. It is technically easy to accomplish. But its implication and impact upon the human rights architecture can be very wide and unpredictable. Perhaps even today we do not fully realize what the consequences of this passport can be if not done wisely and in good spirit. Today we will be discussing the results of a comparative study which was undertaken by Global Digital Human Rights Network in 23 countries. We are going to introduce the study and are going to discuss it. To open today's webinar, I'm very pleased to give floor to Estonian Foreign Minister, Eva Maria Limets. Dear Professor Susi, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to provide opening remarks on the issue which occupies all of our minds constantly. First of all, I would like to commend the Global Digital Human Rights Network for completing the valuable study on the human rights aspects of the COVID-19 immunization passport. The COVID-19 pandemic impacts every country and region of the world. Unfortunately, the pandemic has worsened the human rights situation in more than 80 countries, and the level of uncertainty is unprecedented. Therefore, our joint efforts by governments, academia, and civil society should be in rolling back the overall human rights situation and especially helping those in the most vulnerable circumstances. But at the same time, people are longing for normalcy. Thus, the topic of vaccine certificates is emerging in all corners of the world. Let me also emphasize in this regard that Estonia makes clear distinction between vaccination passports and vaccination certificates. Overall, there are constant discussions within and among governments as well as other stakeholders on how to proceed. From one hand, we have the aspect of facilitating travel and overcoming economic crisis, but at the same time, there are questions related to possible discrimination and data protection. Digital solutions, including vaccine certificates, must be designed and used in full respect of human rights, including the right to privacy. The solutions should also be proportionate and justified. As many countries are currently progressing with their own digital vaccination certificate solutions, which do not provide any automatic rights per se, we need to make quick progress to agree on common standards and principles. Estonia supports the initiative by the European Commission on the Digital Green Certificate. We need a common framework to be able to verify medical certificates across borders and make sure that certificate is authentic and issued by an authorized and trustworthy source. It is also important to align the EU framework with the global one. That relates to the discussions led by the World Health Organization on the smart vaccination certificates. Estonia is actively contributing to WHO's work with our expertise and providing our views on creating a global trust framework. We hope WHO will integrate and include our views to the Global Trust Framework in their final work. The aim should be to have a system that does not deepen the existing inequalities, works also in low resource settings, is time and cost effective and helps to provide a real and sustainable solution to interoperability problem. The framework should enable connecting trusted stakeholders in each country to an open source platform. 
From the privacy and security point of view, it is important to emphasize that the framework is based on the principle of decentralized data management. This means that it does not require transferring sensitive health data across borders or creating centralized databases. At the same time, we fully understand the ethical concerns regarding the possible unintended use of the vaccination certificates and the need to avoid any kind of discrimination. It is important to emphasize that at the EU level, we are addressing only cross-border verification and this is not about giving any privileges or rights connected to the vaccination. The digital green certificate is free and available in EU official languages. The rights based on the certificate are also extended to lawful residents of the European Union. Our national solution for the digital certificate on vaccinations should be operational by the end of April. Users can access and download their vaccination certificates via national patient portal, and it is building on the existing solution that we currently have in use. In closing, let me also stress the importance of making sure that no one is left behind by, by vaccination programs. Estonia supports efforts for creating the EU vaccine sharing mechanism, which would help countries in the EU neighborhood, such as in the Western Balkans and the Eastern European, in Eastern partnership countries. It is so-called framework of COVAX, based certainly on everyone's free choice regarding vaccination. That would be an important step forward on overall global objective of equitable access to vaccine. I wish you a successful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Limetz, for the position of the Estonian government and also for providing the framework for today's discussion. Estonia is blessed by many visionaries. At the forefront of our visionaries regarding e-governance and digitalization stands globally known figure who doesn't need introduction. He is the speaker for freedom, for providing human rights in the digital space. I would like to introduce former Estonian president, my good friend, Mr. Thomas Henrik Ilves. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Sozi, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Let me just say a few, <clears throat> few comments. Uh, first of all, as we know, uh, in crises, uh, people are under tremendous pressure to make uh, rapid decisions based on too little information. And throughout history, we have seen that th this can lead to <clears throat> disastrous consequences or at least long reaching consequences, be it be it the crisis in Ukraine, where we, where certain actions that are made in split seconds could lead to consequences for decades, or when it comes to our current situation with the vaccine um, <clears throat> and how we proceed. Uh, right now, we know that it is the pressure to open up societies to get people mobile again is increasing at an extremely <clears throat> rapid pace. We see protests, we see, we see in some countries people that are just not agreeing to uh, even the most basic measures such as wearing masks. Uh, but you can sense throughout, throughout the world that uh, people's 
uh, patience is wearing thin, they're psychologically stressed. And so <clears throat> one of the uh, solutions that we see in, and have developed in the world as a way to get around, or to, get, to at least ameliorate these kinds of pressures is to come up with some kind of proof of having been vaccinated, of being therefore able to cross borders and travel or to go to uh, bars or to go to stadiums. And this is a vaccine passport or a vaccine certificate. We will be discussing these today. Um, fortunately, as opposed to earlier eras, we also do have digital solutions that um, enable us to uh, provide rapid, easy, reliable uh, verification of status. This immediately leads to to lots of problems that we've been facing ever since uh, the digital era began, which is that knowledge of digital solutions is relatively limited among uh, the general public. Um, it's it's uh, equally limited among policymakers very often, which has led to a uh, lots of confusion. What is the nature of privacy? How do you guarantee privacy? What are the issues that we have to deal with in this new digital world that we did not have to deal with before? All of these questions need to be dealt with. And this is why I'm glad that um, this conference is taking place because in fact, um, if I read the general press about what uh, these issues uh, involve and entail, um, I see by and large mainly ridiculous positions that are not based on uh, and any kind of knowledge of the kinds of solutions that are available, nor do I see much of an understanding of the fundamental principles that we um, have to abide by and what are not fundamental principles, which is equally important. Uh, uh, for example, I mean, we don't think it's okay if someone refuses to go uh, to show proof of smallpox vaccination, right? Uh, we don't even that's that. But now with the issue of COVID, we have we have people claiming their right not to not to be vaccinated, not to show proof of vaccination, and these are. These issues resonate across the world. We see, in fact, it's even more politicized these days in the United States than it is in Europe, um, which is an, an odd development. So I, I hope that this conference will bring, start to bring some clarity to these issues. Uh, and I hope that it will also bring some kind of understanding of the possibilities of technology that even 15 years ago did not exist through, through distributed, uh, uh, distributed <clears throat> data exchange solutions through blockchain, the things that uh, were would have made a, a genuinely secure solution to vaccine um, <clears throat> certificates unthinkable uh, 15, 20 years ago, but now, uh, is completely possible and is in operation um, in uh, several countries around the world. So I wish you all luck. I will be following all of this carefully and will be participating. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Susi, for taking the initiative to put this on. Thank you very much, President Ilves, for your words. We are proceeding European Union's Fundamental Rights Agency is an institution which uh, has an immense role in safeguarding the uniform protection of fundamental rights throughout the Union. Professor Michael O'Flaherty, who has been um, leading the Fundamental Rights Agency, is an inspiring scholar throughout the world and we are pleased to give floor for Mr. Laflerti, Professor Laflerti, for his statement.
Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in today's meeting. And my apologies that I wasn't able to join you live. I think this is an excellent and timely initiative and I express the deepest of appreciation to Professors Susi and Pajusta, as well as all their colleagues uh, for uh, this excellent work. The basis for today's discussion is an important background document that lays out some of the key issues. And I'm very pleased to inform you that the Fundamental Rights Agency will also publish uh, in this area in coming weeks, looking at the situation across the 27 EU member states as regards developments and discussions of COVID-related passports. Our starting point is, of course, that the passport idea originates in an important intention to get our societies and our economies moving again. We also recognize that, at least in part, uh, the passport idea is not new, uh, as we know, for example, from the experience with yellow fever vaccination and the requirement to show proof of that crossing borders in so many places. However, of course, as you all acknowledge, the human rights issues are very sensitive, in large part, at least, uh, around the principles of legality, necessity, proportionality and non-discrimination. Concerning legality, I welcome the attention in the background paper for this meeting, including with regard to the normative effect of the passport requirements in the private sector. Uh, with regard to the principle of necessity, there is, of course, the underlying issue that we must keep to the forefront of the effectiveness of vaccination, which is a, a sine qua non for any validity of the passport idea. Then comes uh, the matter of proportionality. Uh, here I'm concerned about the rollout to which sectors, uh, in which parts of society for requirement of display of the passport. Uh, we've learned a lot in the past years about treating different sectors, different parts of our societies in different ways. We must bring that learning into this discussion. And finally, then, there's the issue of non-discrimination. I welcome that this also receives attention in the background paper. Uh, but I'm concerned beyond the discrimination of different treatment of those who do and do not have the passport with the issue of those who choose not to have a vaccination the issue of those who cannot have a vaccination because of an underlying health reason, for example. And then, of course, there is the issue of access to vaccination by people in otherwise marginalized groups. Now, I hope that issues such as these will draw your attention today. I wish you well for the discussions. And again, I thank you for the invitation. Professor O'Flaherty, thank you very much for these comments and providing the initial viewpoint of the Fundamental Rights Agency. Last but not least for the introductory comments, it is my pleasure to introduce the Cyber Ambassador of German Federal Government, Regina Rienberger. Thank you for, for having me here and thank you Professor Susi and Professor Pajuste for providing this uh, excellent study. I would like to share with you some thoughts about the current situation and why this study which we are discussing today is so important. Let me begin with an introspection as Germany is one of the case studies of your workshop and, and then go on with some more general remarks or observations on the basis of an European mindset of mine. Germany is often referred to as a positive example of how to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. We were successful in preventing the overburdening of our healthcare system by flattening the curve. And the reasons for this temporary success can be found mainly in our healthcare and medical research system, which was in good shape at the beginning of the crisis. But also because we had time to prepare while the virus hit China and then Italy and France. I'd like to call it a temporary success because it is not over yet. And the long-term economic, political and societal consequences are not clear yet. They say in the crisis, the government's hour has come. 
The German government, as other governments, has taken many, sometimes drastic, measures to curb the pandemic, like closing public venues, cultural institu institutions, shops and restaurants. In Germany, national curfews have never been imposed, and the state of emergency was declared only on a regional level and only for a short period of time. Instead, the authorities most of the time have just asked citizens to observe the basic rules, wear a mask, wash your hands, keep your distance. But like in many other countries, people have been living under these sometimes severe restrictions on public and private life for over a year now. The consequences of the different lockdowns cannot be ignored. And people are tired. They are tired at the beginning of an election campaign. Just to remind you that we in Germany will have general elections in September. They want to return to normal. But how to do this? Reducing protective measures can be potentially as fraud an issue as introducing them in the first place. There are several elements to be considered. We learned that governments must inform the public not just about what they know and want to do, but also what, what they do not know and cannot do. This is the only way to build the trust needed in a democratic society and to make sure that the vast majority of citizens wants to cooperate out of a sense of responsibility for themselves and others. The second issue, the public debate in all our societies is lagging behind the events. The pandemic changed our way of life at such a high speed that we are still struggling to fully grasp the consequences. We still do not have a clear understanding of the time dimension of the pandemic. For how long will this situation stay? Forever? In my view, at this moment, we do not have a proper democratic legitimization of the measures. This defect must be healed in the course of time. Three, we have learned that technical digital solutions can help to speed up measures and to scale quickly. We expect much of these technologies, but at other times we fear what the impact of these applications, tools, and the amount of data collected will be in a longer term. Anyway, the idea of a passport in combination with the use of digital technologies means that as societies, we must renegotiate the hierarchy of values and rights times and again. For example, the individual right to privacy versus the collective right to epidemiologic research and data sharing. And fourth, we, we learn that people do compare the measures and effects of their own government and state to those of others, especially so within the European Union. So European national policymakers must develop a stronger European reflex and ask themselves, is this measure better taken on the national or the European level? And also, if I do this, but my neighbor chooses a different path, what will this mean? In this regard, I think the European Green Certificate is without alternative as it sets a framework for national approaches. The COVID passport is one of the instruments for reopening the economy. It is under an intense debate right now, and I hope your exploratory study will cast a light on the four aspects which I mentioned. Transparency, democratic legitimization, hierarchy of rights, European reflex. I am looking forward to your recommendations. Thank you. Ambassador Greenberg, Thank you highly for your statement and also sharing the views of the German government. We are now proceeding to the highlight of today's event, which is to present the findings of the study, recommendations and subsequent uh, discussion. This study was done in incredibly fast time, within three weeks in March. The facts may be outdated, but the views on fundamental rights aspect will and cannot be outdated. And this is what we are going to present. For our viewers, we have the possibility for you to enter questions through the screen, not difficult to navigate. Please 
do send us your questions. We will be able to discuss them in the panel discussion after the presentation of the results and recommendations. It is my pleasure to introduce my good colleague, Associate Professor Tina Pajuste, to give us an overview of the findings of an incredible amount of scholars who have given their input into this study. Professor Pajuste. Good day to everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the findings of the comparative study to you today. One of the aims of the study was to look into the discussions being held around the world and in Europe on vaccine passports. There is less debate about a vaccine passport outside of the European Union. For example, as of February, this topic was not under discussion in other regional organizations like the African Union or Mercosur. Discourse in the participating countries highlights both the strengths and weaknesses of a potential standardized vaccine passport. In general, there is the perception that there should be free access to vaccines before a vaccine passport could provide special rights or easier access to certain venues or services. Positive aspects that have been highlighted in discussions include, for example, the idea that vaccine passports may offer a way to overcome the economic crisis, especially in the tourism and leisure sectors, and it could contribute to restoring mobility at the European level. It's interesting to note that the positive view of vaccine passports in the tourism sector is not universal. This is because some of the companies consider a potential obligation to have a vaccine passport as excessive, and more restrictive than the current situation, which, in their opinion, may actually decrease the number of travelers or customers. A positive technical aspect of vaccine passports that has been emphasized is their potential to improve the verifi verification aspects of vaccinations. Digital verification measures are seen as more secure than, for example, the yellow paper World Health Organization vaccination certificates. There is confidence that an EU-wide vaccination certificate would be functional and fulfill its purpose. There is also positive discourse in relation to the potential contribution to the protection of public health. Negative aspects that are highlighted in discourse are firstly, the potential for discrimination, which was mentioned most often. In addition, significant concerns have been raised in relation to the protection of personal health, health data. And in some countries, there is also the fear of creating a two-tier society in relation to infection prevention rules. The main emphasis of the comparative study was on the human rights issues that arise in connection with a potential vaccine passport. The main challenges are the potential conflict with the right to privacy and personal data protection and ensuring that the right to non-discrimination is upheld. Opinion is divided whether a vaccine passport is a new type of instrument with corresponding new risks. Some academics point out that states already gather large amounts of data about citizens' health status, including vaccinations. And the practice of documenting vaccinations is also uh, well established and providing proof of these vaccinations when you travel. In addition, the requirement of producing a medical certificate for accessing some services is also common in some member states. Others emphasize that previously such documents have been on paper and the data contained in them has not been shared amongst different states. And in addition to data sharing amongst states, the data will probably also be shared with a wide range of public and private entities when you travel or when you want to access a venue or a service. There are concerns that this type of sharing may lead to data breaches and that private health information may become public. To assess the proportionality of a restriction of privacy, 
it's necessary to identify whether a vaccination certificate system increases health protection. Some authors have noted that there is currently not enough scientific information available to know the effectiveness of vaccination against all the existing types of the virus and the time period of immunity. Therefore, the necessity and effectiveness of the measure are not yet proven, which makes a determination of proportionality difficult. The right to privacy also includes the specific right to say no to medical treatment. If the vaccine passport determines whether you get to participate in social activities, vaccination is no longer a matter of free choice, but rather a recognition of necessity. This is problematic, at least from the perspective of those scholars that believe that the right to refuse medical treatment is an absolute right. A connected issue with the right to privacy is ensuring personal data protection. States have different types of health data systems, so if a uniform vaccine passport is introduced in the EU or globally, many domestic systems will have to adjust to ensure compatibility and that data, data is managed in accordance with relevant legal requirements. Safety of personal data in relation to vaccine passports must be ensured by both technical and legal means. A second set of issues arises in relation to potential discrimination. There are concerns that the vaccine passport could lead to everyday discriminatory choices by individuals, public and private entities. And these choices may lead to discriminatory patterns, either in practice or in law or both. Discrimination can take place on several levels. It can occur within a specific country, within the EU or globally. It has already become clear that not all countries have equal access to vaccines or equal capacity to create efficient vaccination programs. The global divide between the rich and the poor may deepen. Discrimination can also have a horizontal and a vertical dimension. Horizontal discrimination means that the vaccine passport can lead to private profiling and the exploitation of vulnerabilities for commercial purposes. If the area is not regulated, then private companies may demand the possession of a vaccine passport from their clients with no oversight over their decision-making, which may have a discriminatory effect on the population. Vertical discrimination means that in some form or another, public lists will be created. This in itself is a practice against the notion of privacy. It's important to remember that not everyone can get safely vaccinated. So vaccine passports can create a new national, regional or global prejudice against young people, pregnant women and individuals with previous medical conditions. Moreover, people with different uh, religions and their standpoints towards vaccination is also a sensitive issue that needs to be taken into consideration. One of the challenges is to avoid creating a system where vaccination against COVID-19 becomes effectively mandatory and leads to discrimination towards those not willing or able to get vaccinated. It's important to create alternative mechanisms of participation for those who do not carry the passport, like mask wearing obligations or a quarantine. Another issue that the comparative study addressed was the existence of a normative basis to impose restrictions on the basis of a vaccine passport in the exercise of fundamental rights in the public space and accessing public services. In most participating countries, there has been no thorough analysis on whether there is such a normative basis. Most countries have not enacted concrete legislative acts or provisions to deal with a pandemic of this scale and magnitude. One view is that restrictions on the basis of a vaccine passport are unlawful because there is no obligation to accept treatment in the form of vaccination and therefore suffering negative consequences from not getting vaccinated is unlawful. The other view is that the basis for a regular balancing of rights could be used in this context. It's quite common to have constitutional provisions that allow for the restriction of certain human rights in specified conditions. For example, the freedom of movement is not an absolute right, 
and public health reasons tend to be one justification for the restriction of rights. It's also important to bear in mind European Court of Human Rights case law in relation to de facto mandatory vaccinations. Its position has been that vaccination should not be a requirement for exercising fundamental rights, like the right to education or the right to work. But the position of the court may, uh, regarding mandatory vaccinations may be changing, as just last week, the Grand Chamber decided in the case of Avrichka and others versus the Czech Republic that not accepting non-vaccinated children in nursery schools was not a violation uh, of the right to respect for private life. The study also looked at the existence of a normative basis for obliging private companies to enforce restrictions on the basis of a vaccine passport. The results show a complete absence of any such normative basis in national legal systems. This has led to discussions on whether private companies have the legal discretion to make decisions on granting access to privately provided services on their own volition. In other words, this could be considered legally permissible freedom to discriminate. Overall, it seems that most countries have not yet developed a position on whether private companies are allowed to exclude non-vaccinated people from events or travel. Due to the fundamental human rights aspects of vaccine passports, it's vital to provide a clear legal framework for this instrument. There is a need to define the purposes for which the vaccine passport will be used, the right to get vaccinated or to stay unvaccinated, as well as alternative ways for gaining access to the same goods, spaces and services. And this should ideally be done on an international level to avoid the issue of fragmented standards across countries. Thank you very much. I invite everyone to read the study for a more detailed consideration of all the issues. And now Martusi will introduce the recommendations of the study. Thank you, Professor Pajuste, for introducing the results. We are sometimes asked, I mean, our group who conducted this study, what was most surprising. And I think most surprising for us was um, perhaps the consensus, which uh, the majority, I shouldn't say majority if we speak about consensus, which the scholars who participated exhibited in articulating the recommendations. And as always, scholars do provide recommendations, and as always, it is our hope that these recommendations will find their way into considerations when political establishments on national levels and on global and European levels plan their next steps, in our case, regarding the vaccination passport. There are not too many recommendations. We try to keep the recommendations clear, understandable and easy to disseminate. Our first recommendation clearly concerns discrimination. We know that discrimination can be either public or private. When we start with discrimination regarding public discrimination, the study emphasizes and recommends that uh, the need to avoid discrimination in access to public services has always to be considered. And there is a need for providing alternative means for gaining access to public life. This means, the alternative measures mean that vaccination de facto does not become mandatory. We make a distinction between legal and factual mandatory aspect. We don't think anyone could make vaccination legally binding but, de facto, is a possibility. 
We also emphasize that there is a need for a uniform approach to articulate, work out, clear legal framework and standards, at least on the EU European Union level regarding the vaccine passport. Global level would be desirable, perhaps not possible. So that when we get to recommendation number three, that states, at least European states, should refrain from moving vigorously ahead with their national norm creation. It goes hand in hand with the previous recommendation. The sooner European Union can work out, agree upon and disseminate standards for this passport, the sooner the national governments can follow this approach and take regulatory action. If, on the other hand, there is a delay on the European Union level, we will clearly see that there are no other options for national governments to proceed. But that will lead, clearly it will lead, to fragmentation in the European Union. We recommend that when this general legal framework is being worked out for the vaccination passports, measures should be in place against vertical and horizontal profiling. I would like to emphasize the aspect of horizontal profiling. This means that there need to be clear and legally binding operation model for private entities when they condition access to services upon the presentation of vaccine passport. We emphasize legally binding operation model. It is different from recommendations. Private entities may consider recommendations, they may not consider recommendations. If there is a legally binding model, that is different. We also recommend that data protection requirements need to be taken into consideration in all stages of creating the vaccine passport. When we are planning it, when we are taking normative action, and also when we are implementing. I mean under we, I mean the society at large, all the stakeholders who are involved. Our recommendation is to always include human rights aspect as a priority when the matter of the passport is being discussed. Not that it would be a second or third rate aspect, saying that, well, we have a wonderful technical solution, and by the way, it also safeguards fundamental rights. It has to be the other way around. Human rights concern needs to be the first aspect that we take into account. My final slide is to answer the question which is very often asked. Is COVID-19 vaccine passport compatible with human rights standards? And our view is that, yes, it is compatible with human rights standards if there is effective, immediate, and equal access to vaccination to everyone who desires it. And also that alternative measures are providing for accessing public services and measures are in place against private profiling. These are the recommendations of our study. We are now proceeding to the discussion. I would like to emphasize again, this study will be available later this afternoon at the website of the Global Digital Human Rights Network and also at the website of Tallinn University. And today's event can be later viewed also on the YouTube screen. 
we have a panel to discuss the findings and the recommendations. And first, I would like to give word from the Fundamental Rights Agency to Ms. Johanna Gooday, who is heading the research unit at the agency. Johanna, are you there? Can you join us? Yes, I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me and see me. We can, okay. please. Thanks very much. Um, we read with great interest this study uh, that you've brought out and very much sympathise with having to collect such data in such a rapidly uh, short period of time. You heard uh, just a bit ago from my director. I think a couple of points he emphasised, and then I'll just reflect on what uh, your study has shown, is that, of course, we have to emphasise also the, the opportunities, the positive aspects of trying to bring in a vaccine pass. And here, of course, we reflect on the charter, uh, the right to health uh, in the charter, freedom of movement, so relevant articles of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. And it's very much something that we see also in the discussion about the EU Digital Green Certificate, not only the vaccine pass. The Commission has also uh, talked about enabling rights and talked about the need to secure freedom of movement. So I think we also have to be careful, though, in this discussion that we're not merging the discussion about the vaccine pass, which is centrally the focus of the study uh, here today, but also more broader discussions about having a certificate which covers other options besides vaccination. So there are the opportunities and of course there are the, the basic uh, standards or challenges we need to, to put on the table, which you've referred to very, very clearly. So legality, necessity, proportionality, non-discrimination, and then other specific rights like data protection uh, being one of them. And I just want to pick up on a couple of things here, having uh, looked at the study and heard your presentation and various points that you've raised today. Picking on one example in relation to data protection, obviously you've got the European Data Protection Supervisor who um, has commented, for example, on the Commission's certificate suggestions, but we welcome also further commentary at the EU level, but also at the level of uh, data protection authorities. I think, though, we have to remember uh, some of the challenges and problems we face to date when we're talking about data protection. Uh, there have been discussions about interoperability, and we're really dealing with something that is moving very, very rapidly. And I think we have to reflect all the discussions that were very similar in relation to contact tracing apps and how these did and did not work at so many levels uh, at individual member state level and throughout the EU and globally. So those same questions about data protection, privacy and trust in the state and private companies in terms of uh, what they're collecting, who has the right of access, questions like purpose limitation, all those points we should learn also from our uh, knowledge about contact tracing apps. And the Fundamental Rights Agency published a bulletin a bit ago uh, last year on issues around contact tracing apps. And the same fundamental rights questions come up here in terms of the vaccine pass. But you raise many important questions in that regard. An important point that was made about decentralized data management, which of course is key in this regard. So I think learning from what we know, contact tracing apps, we also can learn from what we know in terms of data interoperability and also privacy concerns in relation to the field of immigration and all the various instruments that have been put in place and the concerns in that regard about exchange of data and information. So secondly, the other broad point that your study raises in relation to discrimination. And this, of course, is not only about those who do and do not have uh, access to a vaccine, but we're talking also about equality of information and access to vaccines. And of course, we have to consider that not everyone, for example, is digitally competent. Of course, Estonia is a country that's often uh, given as the example of a very digitally competent society. So discrimination is not only about those who are and are not vaccinated. And I was happy to hear reference to things like 
consideration for different religious groups who may object on religious grounds to being vaccinated. But of also we have on top of that uh, discrimination considerations in terms of persons with disabilities. Um, people who are, say, have no access to um, computing facilities like the Roma, like socially economically marginalised groups in society. So we also have to recognise that it's not only the potential, I think, as uh, one of the speakers said about a two tier society and discrimination, but a multi tier society we're talking about, about very different levels of um, information and access about a past. Uh, which differs considerably across EU member states, particularly in societies which are less um, attuned to new digital technologies, as is Estonia, for example. You made very, very important points about the private sector, and I think the private sector would like legal certainty. This is also what we hear in the AI field. Often the private sector uh, want legal certainty, and of course that has to be set up as soon as possible. And we're talking about a moving target here with governments and the EU wanting to move very quickly. So that, that is, a, is a key factor which is of concern. It was also very important to hear um, uh, the reference to the recent judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in, in the case of the Czech Republic on its requirement for mandatory preschool vaccinations. So uh, the jurisprudence uh, is, is changing potentially in this regard. We have to keep a close eye on that. And finally, just to say, as you raised many, many important points in this very important study is the point you made about horizontal and vertical discrimination, going back to the issue of discrimination, I think is key in relation to the private sector and then different groups in society and the need for a clear legal normative basis. Finally, I'd just like to add one final point in this regard. I think in all of this discussion, what is really important is to include national human rights institutions in the debate and also equality bodies in the debate. Because, because of course, we've had a year now of responding to COVID. In the initial discussions, the bodies that were established very much included, of course, epidemiologists, um, uh, experts in the field of public health. But what we saw a lack of is representation of NHRIs and equality bodies in this discussion too. Because not only do we need to embed, for example, discussions about data protection, I remember I referred to data protection at the, uh, the level of data protection authorities at the national level. We also need to embed, and I think you very clearly made this point, fundamental rights at every single stage of the design the, and the deployment and the ex post assessment that should be ongoing of any introduction of a vaccine pass. So I'll stop here, but thank you very much for um, what I think is a very interesting study that raises so many questions. Thank you, Miss Goodday. And we would like to then proceed with the discussion, and we have several questions. I would like to ask or start with the question which has a political aspect. It is about the possibility that except defending public health and safety, might vaccine passports become a political tool for states? Ambassador Greenberger, what would you or how would you comment? this question, that vaccine passports not really only become as an instrument to return to normality, but that states can perhaps, if I may, misuse the passports. Well, I think we have seen um, a similar question when we dis were discussing uh, tribal restrictions between states, also between European member states. And our position, GEM position, was always that we should not um, make, for example, bilateral arrangements in order to give benefits uh, to one of our partners um, and not to everybody. So we, we were always looking for, um, for a solution which uh, is based on, on facts and evidence and a clear legal basis so that we can, um, we can provide, um, we can provide the, a, a fair solution for everybody and not look for, let's say, bilateral um, 
special solutions for special friends. So uh, for us, this was always very important. With regard to, to, the, to the vaccination passport, I would like to add one um, aspect, and this is that all our measures should be linked to the pandemic. The uh, WHO has declared the state of pandemic at the moment, and all our, our the tools that we introduce should be linked to this state of pandemic. The, I think we, we must make sure, or we, we, we have to consider that there is no other justification for, for such a, a restriction to, um, you know, to equal access for everybody to public, uh, to public venues or public services than the pandemic, which makes it necessary that um, the, the majority protects the minority. So this is uh, this is something um, I think that that the state should have in mind when discussing uh, when discussing the passport. It is clearly not our German intention to use it as a as a political tool. Thank you. Thank you, President Ilves. What would be your view on this matter? Well, on one hand, I'm not sure what that even means. I mean, how would you use? this is a political tool, uh, at least domestically. Um, I, what I do see, I mean, a related problem, I, I see that basically uh, that we can come up with, uh, we, there is the potential in the near future to come up with a European Union approach in which we have, uh, which we have certain rules that uh, certain Certain more importantly than rules, even standards on what what constitutes an effective passport or vaccine immunization or vaccination passport, and what can, what that information may have, what who can access it, and so forth. I think where the problem comes in, and which will then be politicized, is that we really don't have a concomitant trust. Uh, towards third party countries. Uh, I can imagine, I mean, because of the long history of uh, you know, the Safe Harbor Agreement and other discussions that at least with the United States, we can come quickly to some kind of agreement. Once we go to countries toward which in any case, the European Union is somewhat dubious of their standards, of their um, the quality of their certificates where agreements are are missing. Um, once we already know that at least with paper, paper certificates uh, or, or documents, we already have discovered, I think I read in the in Charles de Gaulle airport, there were people were using uh, counterfeit documents. I think it will get very tricky. And I, I suspect that unless we come up with um, with some kind of start working on agreement soon with, uh, say, the uh, the Eastern Partnership countries and further beyond, that we will be uh, that there will be restrictions either on the part of individual member states or more largely on the part of the Schengen Group. Um, you know, when I uh, I just. Uh, I mean, I would say that there's a lack of, if, if there used to be a lack of confidence in the um, administrative capacity of countries that were joining the European Union, um, well, then I would say that uh, the, the lack of confidence in the uh, administrative capacity of governments issuing vaccine certificates in countries that don't even qualify for membership in the European Union, the amount of doubt will be huge, and that will be politicized. Thank you, President Ilves. And I would uh, continue from here with a uh, question again to Mrs. Gooday. It was raised here that there is a threat of a divide, divide between uh, different regions of the world based on their opportunity to get vaccination, perhaps based on the views of the population, towards vaccination, what might the European Union be able to do to minimize the threat of another situation where we are creating different treatment 
between countries throughout the world? Is there anything to be done and what could European Union in particular do about this matter? Thank you very much for your question. I think um, rather than focusing on external issues outside the EU and third countries, which has been raised, I think I'd bring it back into the EU, this question. And it relates also to the comment that was uh, made uh, previously about trust. Because if you're talking about trust, it's not only trust with third countries, but it's also trust internally uh, with the state by its own citizens and also residents in the country. Uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency in our own research, so recently uh, we did a survey of over 35,000 people across the EU, uh, and we included questions about trust in the state. And what we saw is huge differences between EU member states and between different groups within the population that we surveyed within a member state. So it goes back to the point I made earlier about the potential to have multiple layers of not only discrimination, but also reflecting lack of trust in the state. So again, we can see from clear, robust, empirical evidence that's not just based on, say, uh, our assumptions, is that people, for example, who are struggling to make ends meet uh, socioeconomically, people with lower education levels, they will tend to have lower levels of trust in their own state when we look at EU member states than people who have higher levels of education. Of course, there are great differences within this broad generalization, but we see that this is quite clear. So we need to take this evidence and we need to focus, therefore, on interventions with certain groups in society to really uh, build that trust, uh, not only in questions like vaccination, but trust in the state in terms of what they will do with that data. This also brings in, and it hasn't really been touched on so far, the huge issue of misinformation globally. So I think that, of course, touches on many, many fundamental rights questions that we're fully aware of, uh, freedom of expression versus, of course, misinformation, and then where the state needs to intervene with clear messaging. So again, we have another layer of fundamental rights questions that come into our discussion about um, access to a uh, vaccine pass, let alone uh, the discussion about a certificate. Thank you. I would continue with um, the discussion about the World Health Organization uh, initiatives. We do not have, have anyone from this organization in the panel, but we know that uh, the organization is right now working on the development of the vaccine passport. There are sometimes concerns and challenges which have been voiced uh, in the public domain about um, uh, what the result will be, if it will be fully transparent uh, passport, uh, if there might be a black box phenomena, if you will. So I would ask uh, President Ilves, based on your understanding of uh, what digital technologies are capable of doing, in your view, is it conceivable that building on the positive experience of Estonia in developing e-technologies we could, in principle, develop a transparent, clear, easy to understand solution, which could be used throughout the world, not only on the EU level. Well, I think I, I think it's. I mean, there, we have to look at the task. I mean, the first, the the simple issue of say proving you are or not are or are not vaccinated. This is extremely simple to do. I mean, it's a yes, no question. You query a, a, a database with an identity saying, is this person uh, vaccinated or not? And that is good enough for almost, for I would say um, most use cases, all right? If you want to, if you're going to uh, get, you get to a border, you show your regular passport, uh, and then the border guard wants to know, have you been vaccinated? I mean, basically he scanned your phone, it says yes or no. Or you show a paper document, but uh, as I said, digitally, uh, it, that's good enough, yes or no. Um, 
Now, if you want to go beyond that, that's where it gets trickier in that you want, you need to get specific data when someone has been, uh, when someone has been vaccinated, what the dates are, um, I don't know what else you maybe want to know. Um, in those cases, then you can build an architecture, which <clears throat> similar to the one that we actually have domestically here and which has been used, which is also used in Finland, uh, Iceland, the Faroe Islands and Moldova and elsewhere. That in fact is, uh, allows you access to specified information. You will need a legal agreement that will allow this uh, to be done because right now it's highly regulated who can access what in my even within my own country, for example, the the uh, workman's compensation board, the one that looks at injuries on the job can look only at a very specific line in your uh, medical records you can't they cannot access anything else, only that which is related to the work accident. So, I mean, it's possible to do it. The, uh, the more, um, what, is the, what is a crucial issue here? Uh, and this is why, uh, well, though I hate the term blockchain, but in any case, um, blockchain solutions are important, is not the issue of data privacy, which is, I think, is it gets 99.9% .9 of the tension when in fact it is of far, far less importance than data integrity. Data integrity is whether the data has been changed or not. How can you trust that something says, yes, he has or she has been vaccinated? Data integrity has been completely missed politically by lots of people obsessed with the minutia of privacy, not understanding that far worse is that if someone changes data than has access to it. If someone sees my blood type, all right, well, it may bother somebody. You may, but not, it doesn't bother me. If someone changes the record of my blood type, it can be fatal. Um, and so on and on, uh, and so on with all kinds of other data. But in any case, we're looking at health data. The issue is, is this information real? Has it been tampered with? I mean, we run into the same issue with vaccines themselves. I mean, have they, it, has the supply chain been reliable and trustworthy? But when it comes to these data, the real issue will be, can you be absolutely sure that this information that you have is real? And I think that we need to pay far more attention to that because in fact, the privacy issue of yes, no, <clears throat> vaccinated or not, <clears throat> all that a border guard needs to know is fairly basic. Uh, and same thing with, I mean, with airlines, whatever, I mean, go on and on is that, is, um, is, it, is this person vaccinated or not? I mean, then it's a political decision on what you do with that. But the point is that verification of vaccination is a simple technological issue. The validity and of, the, um, of that information, however, is a very serious technological issue, but that must be dealt with politically as well. Thank you indeed. Um... A small step technologically, but a very huge step from the fundamental rights aspect. I would like a bit to turn with this discussion now to a specific matter, which uh, also some people in the questions have asked, and which uh, Professor Pajust uh, touched upon in her presentation. It is the recent Grand Chamber judgment of the European Court of Human Rights on Wawrzycka and others versus the Czech Republic case. On a personal note, I must say, when we were preparing for today's event, I invited uh, some judges from the Court of Human Rights to present. And of course, they said they are unable to do it because they speak only via court judgments. And then I was thinking, well, perhaps they anticipate that one day the matter of vaccination passport will be on the court's table, but it may take years. But to our surprise, it happened, the judgment happened before our today's event. 
Uh, it concerned uh, the prohibition of some children in the Czech Republic whose parents had refused to have them vaccinated. They were refused access to preschool. Uh, so, Professor Pius, what would you think? Uh, might we say that the European Court of Human Rights has indicated possible change in the jurisprudence and principles of the court regarding vaccination and the matter of compulsory vaccination? Thank you for the question. I think this is a very interesting question. But first of all, I would say we have to be careful from, uh, regarding the conclusions we draw from this decision. So you have to note that this decision was made in relation to preschools. So it doesn't uh, address mandatory education. So uh, it is a departure from the court's previous kind of um, a trail in decisions. So, uh, but this may be due to the the prominence that the non uh, the, that the anti-vaccination movement is uh, gaining in Europe. So the court's uh, decision making may be impacted by that as well. So it's becoming a real serious health c concern that more and more people are refusing vaccinations. So this may lead to a more serious change in the. Uh, health situation and also uh, the related decision making in the court. But this decision specifically dealt with uh, preschool education. So it doesn't deal really with the fundamental right to education. So I would guess that the court would still make a decision in line with its uh, previous jurisprudence when it actually came to um, uh, proper uh, like higher education than, than preschool level. Thank you indeed. You pointed out correctly that uh, the matter which was on the court's table was related to privacy rights. Whether this uh, blocking of children to go to preschools violated the right to privacy, the court found it did not. But it did not address the matter of right to education. So again, let us emphasize that those children who were not vaccinated were allowed access to schools, to education. That right was uh, not infringed. We have about 15 minutes left, and I would like now to proceed to discussing something which very often has been asked. The narrative is, if you are a shop owner, restaurant owner, managing a private company, you can decide who enters your premises who doesn't enter. There is a funny statement in Estonian media when a shop owner has said, if I want to let in only people who are wearing costumes of clowns, it is my right to do so. Well, probably it is not the right, but on a more serious basis. Um, Mrs. Goode, what would you say to people who ask the Fundamental Rights Agency and say, um, I'm managing a local shop. I can demand from people presentation of vaccine passport as a condition for entering my premises. Does the shop owner have the legitimate right to do so? And I apologize, it is a bit provocative question, but, but it is a very acute question. Uh, yes, it's a tricky question. I think we also need to um, remember, of course, that the EU has uh, directives in place in terms of access to goods and services where you are, are prohibited from discriminating against certain groups in society, so certain protected grounds. Uh, and there's, you know, a volume of case law in that regard. So we would have to reflect in existing case law in relation to discriminating against certain groups in society, for example, on the base of ethnicity as one example there. Um, in terms of uh, this, it's very tricky for me to comment at the moment because we simply don't know um, what is being suggested at the level of individual member states, let alone uh, at the level of the EU. So I would say we have to draw on what we know from existing case law, existing directives on the basis of where you can and cannot discriminate. And of course, reference was made earlier about the potential to discriminate against persons with certain religious beliefs who may not 
uh, agree to being vaccinated. And therefore, one can argue if you refuse to, to allow entry to certain individuals, this may be say, infringing on, on uh, their freedom to, to, uh, to practice their religion. One can stretch this any way at the moment uh, because we're speculating simply how this will be enacted in practice. But the point I made earlier is, of course, that I think the private sector would like some legal certainty. And the same point is made in all the discussions at the moment about the introduction of uh, law in relation to artificial intelligence, etc. Whilst we're all told that these wonderful digital tools will be in place to make our lives easier, uh, our movement through society easier, not only in terms of a pandemic, but in other situations. Private companies are very nervous about implementing areas where there's no um, guidance by the state in terms of how they should or should not act. Uh, so, I mean, I think, again, it's very difficult for me to comment more broadly on the legality of this, but I think it's the need for legal certainty. The private sector will want that as soon as possible. And we have to reflect, of course, on existing EU law about discrimination in access to goods and services. Indeed, and, and, and thank you for this. Uh, and, and of course, the need for clarity is important uh, both for private companies, but also for all of us who very much use the private services on a daily basis. Of course, for um, lawyers, uh, the problem here is that we, or predominantly, the regulation um, which touches upon the obligation of private companies to safeguard fundamental rights uh, is more on the level of soft law, more on the level of recommendations, even if we speak about the United Nations uh, general principles. Uh, a recommendation is something that uh, you may live up to or you may not. And if you have uh, on the scale from one side your capability of maintaining your business and, and paying your employees and from the other side the possibility that you safeguard fundamental rights, but you lose your business, who knows on what side or on, on what direction the scale will go. Uh, let me proceed to the matter of uh, discrimination from here. And, and it was something with what uh, we started. And, and let me ask uh, from Professor Pius, who have been studying discrimination a lot in your previous research. We do understand that discrimination is um, unequal treatment of people on the basis uh, of uh, elements which are beyond their control, on the basis of color, race, religious beliefs, disabilities. Could we say that in a situation where um, people would like to get vaccination, but they are unable to get it, it is a factor which is beyond their control. Could we then say that in principle, issuing vaccine passports, introducing vaccine passports, as long as vaccination is not possible for everyone. Could you say that it might be then, uh, by default, considered as a discriminatory approach? Again, this, um, this depends on the specifics. If, if we're really talking about vaccination being the only way of accessing services or goods or venues, then uh, yes, I would believe that this amounts to discrimination. But if this certificate uh, provides also information about uh, alternative methods, so if you've had a recent negative COVID test or you have uh, had the disease and recovered, and those are also bases that provide you with access, then it is not as problematic. So you have to be careful what is really um, the basis for, for accessing the, the services and the, uh, for travel as well. So uh, I think the EU has taken the correct approach in not really uh, creating this vaccination passport, but rather this green pass that includes more information uh, in addition to vaccination. We are now getting closer to the end of our uh, webinar and I would now like to give about two minutes for all our panelists for the final comments. And if I may ask from, um, from all of you and from all of us to try to predict what is the situation in one year from today regarding the vaccination passports, what may, might lie ahead in the immediate future, what should we take into account? President Ilves, 
what would be your vision and recommendations regarding the immediate future? Um, well, uh, I would, I would, having been dealing with the European Union for the last 25 years, I would say that um, make it a real priority. I mean, this it's, I mean, put someone in charge of this. We have seen from our own country the absence of any one person or body dealing with uh, the COVID issue that when it is distributed among all the various relevant agencies, each of which has, is a, as it were, a stakeholder, that things move very, very slowly. What we need is a, uh, a task force appointed yesterday that would be where the person in charge would be someone who has an understanding of these issues and would be given a green light to move quickly to talk to, a, to, talk to all of the various authorities, be they the member state health ministers or their IT people and their legal departments. But I mean, having sort of occasion, having meetings in which we, it is agreed we will move ahead with the vaccine passport is not enough. It will not get done, certainly not done in uh, quickly enough so that we can get the economies moving again, people moving again to decrease the psychological stress of isolation that people feel and have felt for over a year. And so I would say to make it a far bigger priority, uh, really have a team that deals with these issues. People also from who are experts in, in the human rights area so that you would just be working 24 seven, you would be working at least 12 hours a day, but seven days a week on these issues to get them done quickly enough. The technology moves far faster, the science moves far faster. Uh, it's not a nine to five, let's wait until the next council meeting kind of thing, which unfortunately it seems to be turning into. So that would be my advice. In terms of a year from now, well, a year from now, I would assume that uh, we have all become used to uh, and gotten over any kind of uh, current nervousness about having an app in your phone that certifies you have been vaccinated. And that's, um, and that that becomes just unfortunately a part of normal life. We cannot predict yet at this point, uh, <clears throat> but what, um, how various mutations will affect things. Maybe in six months, we will have to go through this again and we will need to have booster vaccination certificates added on to the primary certifications that we have. I mean, these are all issues that I cannot predict right now, or no one can actually, to be honest. But nonetheless, I mean, we need to really take a far more proactive approach to this uh, on the part of the European Union. And separately, we need to develop really a, a concrete policy on what to do, what are the minimal standards and requirements for other countries, because of course the European Union is not an island. We have lots and lots of neighbors um, and we do want people to be able to travel back and forth with, with other, with outside the European Union. And this too, I think requires a sub task force to deal with these issues taking into account that there are very different countries with very different technical capacities, with administer, different administrative capacities. Um, but we need to move, take this far more seriously um, because that's the next step. Right now, we are all, all concerned with getting as many people vaccinated as possible. But once that does is done, it's, it's not good enough to say, okay, now we will start with the issue of vaccination certificates or passports. We need to deal with it now. Thank you, President Ilves. Mrs. Goodday, is Fundamental Rights Agency able to achieve a situation that we are not too late and one day we are not simply waking up and seeing that there is a vaccine passport in use and uh, all the threats and challenges which academia has been alerting to 
perhaps uh, simply a matter of academic debates of the future? Well, the European Parliament itself will be debating uh, the issues around not only a vaccine pass, but the EU's digital green certificate. That will be coming up shortly, that debate. And not only studies like this study, uh, and as my director and I mentioned, the Fundamental Rights Agency is also producing its own study on this issue covering all member states will feed in with evidence about different responses at the level of individual countries uh, to the suggestions. So I think very much uh, the debate is going to go to the level of the parliament and, and as was said just now of course time is of the essence and one would hope in that regard in terms of fundamental rights limitations we're talking about time limitations on the introduction of anything be it a pass or certificate that it cannot be like emergency government powers with us ad infinitum it cannot be something that that is allowed in in law it has to have a time limit uh, hopefully when the pandemic um, is eased uh, across the eu and globally I think the point that I would just make is that, of course, um, the issue of a EU digital green certificate or something like that raises less uh, fundamental rights concerns than if we're only talking about having a vaccine pass. Of course, the digital green certificate also raises a number of fundamental rights concerns, but there are more options open for people who are not vaccinated or who do not want to be vaccinated. For example, being able to show a, a negative um, test result from a vaccine test. I think to sum up, though, what you need is a holistic um, fundamental rights assessment addressing some of the key factors that have been outlined in your study. Uh, and that needs to happen, though, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, key fundamental rights experts working with government authorities that are currently working on how to respond to the ongoing pandemic situation. And that needs to happen with, like I said, having those experts discussing uh, the development of these tools, because typically it's oftentimes left to those with the digital expertise, the know-how, and fundamental rights is kind of bolted on. Uh, so it's not fundamental rights by design, but it's fundamental rights as a kind of an add-on consideration, or it's in the preamble, or it's referring to basic uh, standards at a, a level of abstraction, which doesn't allow you then to think about the very practical application of those rights when we're talking about either a pass or a certificate. So that needs to be embedded at every stage. And we can learn so much from what we've already done in relation to contact tracing apps, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and also in other fields, like I mentioned, like the notion of travel between EU member states and from third countries, where we have the issue of data interoperability using quite sophisticated tools and all the similar fundamental rights questions that have been raised about um, the quality of the data input, how it's used, who uses it and for what purpose is just one example. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all, uh, all the listeners, all the panelists. It's been an incredibly interesting discussion. We only can hope that uh, some of the ideas, recommendations, findings, which have been here today, will find their materialization in the future developments of policies on the national level, on the EU level and on the world. On behalf of our team, uh, we wish you a pleasant day. Please disseminate the results of the study. Look up our study from the websites. It was a challenging event today. We wish you all the best. Good day.